Quick your pro tip program. We're gonna do a brief walkthrough through this market model just to kind of work it out and kind of understand. I'm pretty sure I figured it out uh, because Adhere Gear is kind of like a hybrid between a few different existing markets uh, along with a new market that's coming into play. Um, and then with those three elements, a new need surfaces. Uh, which is what Adhere Gear is filling is that need. Um, so we're going to start with looking at just basically the numbers. So we narrowed it down to transportation is one of the key categories, and then luggage and security. Those are kind of like the three categories. We're determined security, though, and you can just go ahead and stay blank because at the end of the day, security doesn't really make money or... I, I, it does, but the way it's run right now, it's, it's, it's fueled with, you know, $8 billion from Uncle Sam. So it makes money, but at the same time, it's coming from a source that doesn't really um, allow you to use the numbers, I guess you could say, correctly or in a way that supports this model. It supports the model, but it's not worth looking at the numbers, in my opinion, right now. Um, now, transportation, we broke it down into two categories, which is the U.S. passenger drone market uh, and the U.S. airline market. Both pretty much are aviation flight um, forms of transportation. One is very heavily exists, the airline. The other one somewhat exists, um, definitely being fueled by research and development and a target date of 2023 launch. So right now, looking at the drone market, 2018, it's a $14.1 billion market with a 20.5 compound annual growth rate. By 2023, it's looking to be a 29.5 compound annual growth rate, um, gaining a few more billion dollars. I, I think it'll be a lot bigger than that, um, and I'll explain why in a second. Looking at the airlines, uh, they make 145 billion. Uh, these are just US too, these are all US. 145 billion into 2018. Um, by 2023, we're looking at 207 billion. So pretty good growth there. Uh, a 7.4 uh, CAGR for, um, for 2018. The top three, we do have the top three for drones too, but the top three companies for airlines in the US are gonna be UAL, which is United Continental, um, which has $37.73 billion in revenue for 2017, uh, 148 million passengers moved, and 12.95 aircrafts, 1,295 aircrafts. Uh, sorry, not 0.95, 1,295. The next one is American Airlines Group, $42.2 billion, with a net of uh, $1.9 billion. 100, uh, 1,545 aircrafts, so a few hundred more aircrafts than United Airlines, and they moved 200 million passengers uh, in 2017. The last one is Delta, 186 million passengers, uh, 41.24 billion uh, in terms of uh, how much they made, um, 867, uh, 1,000. 1,800, no, that's a parenthesis, 867 um, aircrafts on their fleet. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of the two markets. Um, you know, these guys, airlines is very similar to medical. You got to put a lot of money in to get a lot of money out. I'm, I'm sorry, a lot of money in to get a little bit of money out. So it's very, very, not tight, but a lot of that has to do with a few different variables. And we'll get into those. The U.S. drone one, however, has extremely high growth. And my projections are saying it's going to get even higher due to the fact that this one is slowing down for specific reasons. Um, part of it has to do with the technology and the airline industry is pretty old and dated in terms of the, the fleets. You know, these are very old um, 747s and some of these other jets that, that we use for passenger aircrafts. Um, Looking at the luggage now, uh, it's a $27.4 billion industry in the U.S. for bags and luggage. Took a lot of time to separate those out, realizing that the 27.4 is bags and luggage. Luggage specifically, which is the more important number, is a $2.9 billion industry in 2018. 
So we're looking at 3.8 billion, a um, little just shy of a uh, hundred million dollars to a, a billion dollar growth between uh, 2018 and 2023 is what our math came out to be. And that's uh, CAGR around 2%. Samsonite uh, is $3.8 billion globally is how much they pull from that. Uh, 1.4 billion in the U.S. So out of the 2.9 billion in 2018, Samsonite made just shy of half that money just in their side. Now they own a lot of companies that people don't know um, or understand that they're all parent companies of each other. So Toomey, for example, who did very well, is also uh, they're owned by Samsonite. So there's a lot of metrics there that you have to add them all up to truly get a good idea of how much Samsonite's dominating the luggage side of things. They've also gone through bankruptcy and a few other things many times, multiple owners, looks like 10 to 15 different owners um, over their history. So a lot of in and out, a lot of acquisitions. They actually got, every time they got purchased, it looked like it was pretty cheap, in my opinion, for some of the volume that they're doing. Um, they've been going through a lot of... Um, acquisitions in terms of picking up a lot of companies uh, to kind of beef up the Samsonite company and, and kind of continue to dominate that market uh, by staying ahead with acquisitions. So um, yeah, a quick side fact, online luggage is the fastest growing accessory category. I thought that was interesting because it's pretty much saying that of all the accessories, Luggage is growing the fastest, which means the concept of booking luggage online uh, through the rental model is probably pretty sound uh, as people get more comfortable. There's not much to want to see with luggage in person, especially with the simplified versions that are on the market now. You know, they just have wheels, a lock, you know, colors, some striations, you know, to make it look cool and, and to provide structure for the, uh, uh, the plastic cases and stuff. So... Not much to look at, and that's probably why online is growing pretty good, because with some 3D rotational models, you could probably accomplish convincing someone of which one to get quite easily uh, between aluminum and plastic. So, all right, now getting into some of these diagrams. Um, this is the original diagram we're looking at. Pretty much it has luggage at 2.9 billion, an existing market, and then we have the aviation flight market, commercial passenger planes, 145 billion. And then we have commercial passenger drones at 14.1 billion um, as an emerging market. And here gear is nestled in here, and we're pretty much calling this zone the the zone where um, where smart luggage is, is pretty much born in terms of its purpose. So moving on to this diagram, it's the scale is a little a little off, but it does give a good idea of how these overlap. So you got existing luggage, which is smart luggage as well as uh, traditional luggage, 2.9 billion, 27 billion in terms of bags. And then you have the aviation industry, industry which is flight, um, passenger, commercial passenger flight on jets for uh, 145 billion. And then again, you have the drone passenger um, emerging market at 14.1 billion. Um, so what we've done is looked at this and said, okay, um, there's going to be an overlap uh, between luggage and aviation. They're already that's already existing, and, and it's smart luggage. But as you progress through the years, that overlap gets larger and larger um, due to the fact of what's going to be happening with this drone passenger uh, emerging market. So this market, the reason why it's so important. And that's what the green dotted uh, circles that grow on the outside. The reason why it's so important is because the airports, um, this category, the aviation having to do with just the, uh, the flights, uh, commercial um, flights on the, um, at airports, they're tapped out. So their maximum capacity of how many jets they can handle, the volume, uh, passenger load, occupant, occupancy density within the architecture that was built for many of those airports, all those things are pretty much tapped out, if not very soon. Um, to my knowledge, most of them are tapped out, though. So they're doing quickly trying to do a lot of renovations and additions, but then they're kind of tapped out in real estate as well because the way these things were planned originally, 
they were nestled in areas where they end up running into massive conflicts um, having to do with regulations with sound and you have neighborhoods nearby. So even if you were to buy everything out, you still have the sound issues with the decibel levels being uh, not tolerant or not good for people that live in the surrounding areas uh, as you increase the number of jets coming in and out. So that category for the most part is going to be tapped out. The only other way around that is to build new airports altogether on new pieces of real estate. And that's, you know, it took us 60 years to get to this point with those. So the reason why this drone passenger is so, this emerging market is going to be good is because the cost to operate these things is not only going to be extremely efficient because it's an alternate fuel. So you're going from a market uh, with the jets that's operated on fossil fuels uh, to a drone passenger market, uh, which is going to be based on electrified uh, electric propulsion um, and electric engines. So that changes the electricity. The other good thing that's about, so this, so for drones, at this point, they're projected to do, um, um, what's, what, how did I call it? Short to medium distances. And then the jets are doing medium to long distances. And I believe the jets, they're going to probably focus on mostly long distances in the future with electrified engines um, at the helm in terms of the energy of choice for operating. And then the drones projecting will take over all the short to medium. Um, so they'll either dominate that market in terms of growth and start spreading covering the aviation um, in terms of the, the jet side, um, or they're going to pick up all the new passengers that can no longer be handled at the existing airports that are tapped out. So it's going to be one of the two. Um, and because of that, there is going to be in this drone passenger market, especially for those medium distances, you're going to end up with a new security that's going to be needed to cover those passengers uh, with these carry-ons. And those carry-ons, as this grows, it starts to overlap more and more with luggage, which means because these are so technologically advanced, you know, these drones are, are literally technology from 2020, whereas the jets are technology from 1970s, 80s, and 90s. So very, very dated types of infrastructures compared to what these are going to be operating on. So the luggage was designed and has crafted over time to match this industry. But with this emerging industry, you're going to have this new secondary emerging industry that's going to happen, which is going to be the smart luggage. And I believe that a more universal unified network um, is going to be better versus the way that it's traditionally done where you just sell it to the consumer, direct to consumer, um, you know, uh, via retail or online. Uh, I don't think you'll ever be able to get a successful, secure model, uh, giving it to the consumer to keep. So I think it has to be a rental model, which means this segment grows uh, side by side with this segment, maintains this one, grows side by side with this one, especially for the medium um, medium and potentially long distance travels that these drone passenger flights are going to do. They're going to start out as, uh, you know, manned and eventually they're going to go unmanned, you know, UAV uh, passenger drones. So um, I have some dates here. I, I, I got to re mess around with it. A, a, you know, and here gear is represented here as right in that overlap where you would see smart luggage happen. The thing is at here gear is too big, you know, it needs to be a lot smaller um, the opportunity is huge, but Adhere Gear, very small in that opportunity that's happening right now, which is somewhere right here. But as it grows, it should eventually overlap completely. Um, and then in theory for us, we'd have another industry in this aviation, probably slightly outside, slightly outside. So it'd be like something like this. And that would be commercial 
space flight. And it's pretty much the highest end version of flight travel with um, passenger drone travel probably coming in the cheapest, you know. So if your average ticket price here on a jet is, let's say it's $100 to $200 right now, um, you know, round trip, uh, probably $200 on average round trip, then your passenger drone flights are probably going to be like $10, $15 round trip. And then your commercial space flight is going to take this to another level and say that's probably like $1,000, you know, round trip. And that's, you know, year 2030 or something like that, 2032. Uh, it could possibly be 2028. 20, it just depends on how quickly we innovate and, more importantly, how quickly the law adapts. Um, but, yeah, that's the opportunity. Those This emerging with two existing really does create... Matter of fact, this ex this emerging probably needs to overlap a little bit with the luggage, just a little bit. I I, I really believe did the drone passenger industry. I'm not quite sure. I haven't talked to any of them yet, but I'm not sure they know how big their need is is going to be for the smart luggage. And pretty much the reason being that. If you have a $20 million or, or $50 million drone passenger plane um, starting out, and they probably will come down in value to, you know, maybe like $5 million or something like that, um, in terms of how, how much it costs to, to make them. As they get more prevalent, they'll become cheaper to make. Um, with those kind of valuations being that they're no, new tech, though, it, it's going to be even more important to monitor the types of things that are brought on those things because their investments haven't necessarily paid off yet. Whereas for the existing uh, aviation and flight industry, you're looking at the risk is really minimal because those planes are already, you know, 30 years old and have been cycled out in terms of um, and maintenance and repaint it. So they, they've already seen a lot of their return. So it's not much risk. You know, if you were to lose one, it's not the same as losing a brand new. It's like having a, um, you know, a car that's 25 years old, a Honda Civic. And if it were to get it totaled, then the insurance company, even if you just got a small accident in the parking lot, they're just going to pay you out and say, Hey, here's your thousand bucks. Um, you know, in aviation terms, it'd be like, hey, here's your, you know, $20 million. Uh, whereas for the drone passenger planes, there's still premium, like a brand new Honda Civic 2020. If you get an accident there, you know, and it's fully loaded, now you're looking at a full payout of like, you know, $30,000, $30, you know, to get that Honda Civic replaced under the same insurance. So there's a little bit more reason to monitor those personal possessions that go on board these new expensive uh, aerial aircrafts. So, yeah, that kind of, you know, so pretty much you're saying there's going to be rapid growth with IoT, Internet of Things, to keep up with the new mobility and means of transport, transportation that fuel that mobility. Um, there's going to be rapid growth in this drone passenger market, enormous opportunity, micro launch pads is really nice. So you don't have to build a huge giant airport to accommodate these. You can literally take the top of a skyscraper or the top of a building or just build a, a small landing pad since they have vertical takeoff and you're good to go on that network, you know, and it could spread quite quickly. Um, whereas these, you have to have these massive runways and they have to be graded a certain way and all these, this physics and math that gets involved in making sure the drainage and all this stuff. It's very, very, a lot more complex than that model in terms of flight. Um, and you have planes that are, these will have the latest and greatest software and autonomous, all this other stuff. And these are going to be, you know, autopilot and such, but still not nearly the same in terms of tech. So, yeah, now I'm taking a deep breath. Um, I have to figure out how to put this in one slide. <laughs> one slide on my pitch deck. But I maintain that that's the market. I do. Like my son says, I did do. So, um, yeah, there it is. So maybe one day this video will go viral and people will see 
that this is a pretty damn good assessment of existing market and projecting what the next five to 10 years is gonna look like. So anyways, we'll, uh, we'll try and condense all this onto one slide with no more than two sentences and a really, really sexy graphic uh, that you know a five-year-old could read. Um, and hopefully that, that nails it for our, our fundraising. So yeah, with that, everybody have a great evening. I'm gonna pack up, take some pictures and head home and probably watch this video a hundred times. Uh, to understand how to craft this into a slide and we will catch up with everybody tomorrow. Full day tomorrow. Figure out.